I'd like to make a few words uh, of, uh, to the class and speak to them directly. So I'll ask our distinguished guests to um, to uh, in, indulge me as, uh, and I'll ask our guests uh, and others that have attended to indulge me as well um, as we as I talk here to our our class. Uh, we started this journey together eight months ago. Uh, I'm, as Gary indicated, I'm honored not merely to be your dean, but also your very first instructor at Bryan University. We were all pretty nervous for that first class. New faces, new technology, a new educational experience that was an experiment for all of us. You are a brave uh, and courageous group, and that was apparent to me from our very first class together. Uh, you hung with me, uh, guided me uh, through my errors and my mistakes, and yet maintained a level of civility, camaraderie, uh, grace, and dignity through the whole process. Uh, you are truly an exceptional group. But back then, it looked to us as though it was going to be a long journey ahead. You were facing, in addition to the course I was teaching, which was Introduction to E-Discovery, uh, you were facing eight additional courses, each approximately one month long, uh, with very distinguished faculty. And then also you, to survive our laboratory, which was designed to test your mettle. So each one of you took on an excruciatingly difficult challenge at the beginning, and it looked at the beginning as though it was going to be a long and difficult march. But here we are today. Look at what you have accomplished. You have mastered computers and technology, being taught by Chris Yule, who's with us here today. You've drafted litigation holds, front-end holds and back-end holds under the direction of Cecil Lynn. You've created processing specifications, working with Helen bergman More. You create, you search millions of documents using the finest a discovery tools in the classes that I've taught. You've structured reviews with Denise Talbert as your instructor and practiced how to do reviews properly. You've built e-discovery budgets and tailored them uh, as needed depending upon the circumstances of the case under the guidance of Scott Cohen. You've learned how to negotiate with vendors and attorneys uh, under the direction of Vera. Nevin, and you've even studied e-discovery case law with Wendy Axelrod. And then, that not being enough, that not being enough to put you to the final test, we had you enter our laboratory uh, to prove your mettle, to prove that you could apply all these skills on the fly. And then in the second half of our laboratory, we put you through every, every crisis we could think of involving e-discovery. And here you are today, very successful, wonderful attorneys, wonderful e-discovery uh, professionals to be. You've run the e-discovery gauntlet. And to steal a phrase from the great American writer William Faulkner, you not merely endured, but you prevailed. You have finished your apprenticeship. And today, you graduate as e-discovery professionals. You've invested time, energy, and precious resources to advance your careers while doing the difficult job of managing family, friends, and employment. I'm proud to know each one of you as a student. I'm proud to know each one of you as an e-discovery colleague. And I'm proud to know each one of you as a friend and personally. But let me speak for a moment about our mission going forward together. Our mission collectively is now more than personal advancement. Our litigation process here in the United States and in other countries is threatened. We in the past have endured uh, in our civil society because of our dispute resolution system, which is an advocacy system that pits parties together in the belief that truth will emerge and that truth will emerge publicly. E-discovery has challenged those, the foundation of that process, which is why we have our e-discovery program here at Bryan University, and I believe at the bottom of it all, why each one of you has enrolled and dedicated 
a significant portion of your life to make this accomplishment to become new discovery professionals. The task before us, though, is to breathe new health into this system of public dispute resolution. Public is an important word. It's the, it's the holds us together. It's the ties that bind. All too many corporations, business, and individuals are retreating to private dispute resolution with social consequences that can't be seen, measured, or evaluated at this point. We want to preserve our public dispute resolution mechanism. So the question for us, and for you, and me, and the faculty, and your colleagues going forward, is whether we can make electronically stored information the key to truth seeking, instead of a looming burden of cost and expense. Our challenge is that we can we can we use the challenges of electronically stored information to breed cooperation, civility, and common enterprise in the search for truth instead of adversarial bickering that costs money, delay, and loss. It is our mission as e-discovery professionals to carry this burden forward each day as we perform our duties and our responsibilities. E-discovery, as I hope you have learned in the nine months, eight months you've been with us, is a very special industry. Uh, it really is full of generosity, help, and collegiality. Treat your colleagues well in e-discovery, and they will reciprocate. I guarantee it to you. I've never asked for help without receiving it from an e-discovery colleague. And believe it or not, your dean doesn't know everything about e-discovery. Uh, just as you have relied upon your classmates, you will need to rely on and consult future colleagues. One of the secrets of e-discovery is not knowing everything, but to know who to call when you need to. And never forget, class, that among your colleagues are your Brian faculty, the board of advisors here at Brian as well. We know you will have a wonderful future, and we eagerly will enjoy watching and helping you succeed in your future e-discovery endeavors. I offer you my deepest congratulations to you, the Brian e-discovery class of August 2012. And now, I take great pleasure in introducing our commencement speaker, the Honorable John C. Facciola. Judge uh, uh, Facciola of the United States uh, District Court in Washington, D.C. Judge Facciola has had a long and distinguished career. Uh, he has been a United States magistrate for many years. Uh, but prior to that, he learned litigation the hard scrabble way as a prosecutor uh, and a district attorney in Manhattan. Uh, he's also practiced on the civil side, so he knows litigation as a private practitioner. Um, he joined the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in 1982 and was a prosecutor for the United States government for many years uh, before he became a United States a magistrate judge. Education is dear to the heart of Judge Facciola. He has been an adjunct professor at Catholic University and Georgetown University a Law Center. And he's also a fellow of the American Bar Association. He's also uh, served uh, as editor-in-chief of the Federal Courts Law Review and the Electronic Law Journal of the Federal Magistrate Judges Association. Even more significantly for e-discovery, uh, John, uh, Judge Facciola, excuse me for calling him John, Judge Facciola, who I like to consider a friend, uh, was also a founder of the Sedona Conference. And I've heard him regale with stories about the early days of Sedona uh, with Richard Bremen on the walking in the nights, figuring out what uh, might be the solutions for e-discovery. And as we all know, uh, the Sedona Conference has, over the past uh, 15 years, developed some of the most fundamental principles that have helped guide us through uh, our e-discovery trials and tribulations, uh, which uh, sometimes they feel we're at the birth of instead of near the end. Uh, judge Fatiola, of course, uh, writes, and he's a, a working judge, 
and has written many important decisions in e-discovery that have guided attorneys uh, through the practice of uh, e-discovery. He's uh, the author of Citizens' Responsibility and Ethics in Washington versus the Executive Office of the President. Uh, also, he's the author of very influential cases, which I have taught in all my cases every year since I've been teaching, which is the United States uh, versus O'Keefe and Equity Analytics uh, versus London. Judge Facciola is a stalwart of the e-discovery world. Uh, he is a man, literally, of all seasons. Now, what more I can say about Judge Franciola is that he's been a driving force for both sanity and dignity in e-discovery. So it is with great pleasure and admiration uh, that I present to you uh, the Honorable John C. Facciola. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Um, obviously, that's not a picture of me in my judicial robes. That is a wonderful J-80, and that is the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, where I sail. I was thinking today of my graduation from law school. Uh, the year before I graduated, the cardinal was there. I went to Georgetown, and apparently he spoke for an hour. Those of you who have had the joy of spending a summer in Washington know how pleasant it is. So it was about 110 degrees as the cardinal droned on and on and on. Well, our turn came the next year, and there was the cardinal. About two minutes before he began, the skies opened in a thunderous thunderstorm that sent everybody scattering. Um, I always felt God's hand in that. And I went off to practice law with that blessing of not having to listen to it. Unfortunately uh, for you, a thunderstorm will not break us up tonight because you're where you have to be, and I can't let you go. So I'm delighted and I'm honored to be with you, and I extend my congratulations to all of you. If you may, if you will, I should say, I'd like to just take a moment to speak, first of all, in favor of a very impractical education. I suppose you will find it absolutely astonishing, but I had such an education. I was probably the last generation of students who were educated according to what was called the Ratio Studiorum, uh, the course of studies in a Jesuit school. And it's, again, you'll find it hard to believe, but I had to study Latin for six years and Greek for five. Um, Indeed, in those days, you could not graduate from my college, at least, without with an A.B., unless you could, unless you have at least two years of Latin under your belt. It may seem odd, but I look back with enormous joy at those classes, and I want to talk particularly about one. Um, in my first year at college, we studied the Apology which is the story Socrates tells um, about the events that lead up to his death. It is his closing argument before the jury of his fellow citizens, his fellow Athenians, because he is going to be condemned by them to die for misleading the youth of Athens. His misleading them consists of going up to them in the Agora, the central meeting place in Athens, and asking them questions that the rest of us spend our lives avoiding. Why are you here? What are you doing? What is the ultimate goal of your life? How do you derive the principles by which you will lead your life? You would then engage with them in what has become known as the Socratic Dialogue, in which he would challenge every statement they made. Now, I went to school in Massachusetts, and you know what the winters are like in Massachusetts. And I was taught by a man named Werner Lovi. Now remember, it's 1962. The Second World War is only, has only been over for 17 years. Werner Lovi is a Jew. He is originally from Germany, but studied at Oxford. I learned either from him or from another source, I don't remember, that most of his family was wiped out in the Holocaust. He survived by being stuck aboard across the border of Switzerland as a child in a duffel bag. 
He was a brilliant teacher, and I will never forget, we came to the end of the Socratic dialogue, where Socrates makes his final closing argument, he translated it into English and had a thorough discussion of what, a, what, what kind of demands a man, uh, could the state make upon a man? Could it even take his life? Underlying all that Socrates did were three principles, which are very easily understood. He said, first of all, you must know yourself. The Greek is nipsi se autorn, and after 50 years, I still remember. Second, know that you know nothing. And the third is that the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, fast forward a couple of thousand, a thousand years or more, and come to Renaissance Italy with me to meet a man named Machiavelli, who writes a book called The Prince. It is directions to the prince on how to achieve, get, and keep power. It is not that Machiavelli is amoral, it is that he doesn't believe in morals at all. Hence, everything that advances the, the, the prince's power must be done, everything that retards it must be destroyed. It would seem that the contrast between these two thinkers has nothing to do with your education. And maybe it has everything to do with your education. If you think about it, the legal system, in which we are all involved, often smacks of a Machiavellian way of doing things. The adversary system takes as its most fundamental principle that it is adversarial, and the people in it are at each other's throats. They must fight to the last quarter to make their point. This leads to the requirement, an ethical requirement, on a lawyer to be a zealous advocate of his client's interests. This leads often to situations that are inexplicable to lay people. Lawyer must cross-examine a rape victim to show that she is not telling the truth when he has every reason to believe she is telling the truth. He must maintain his client's confidence despite other interests. None of us who read the case will ever remember, will ever forget it, but there was a case in New York in which there was a serial killer. He was, his victims were mostly young women. One young woman disappeared in that area and her parents were desperately searching for him. He was arrested on another murder and told his lawyers where he had buried one of the bodies of his victims. The lawyers went to that place, dug up the body to confirm that he wasn't tell in fact telling them the truth, that he wasn't schizophrenic and mad, and then put the body back and never told the parents. Laymen think that is an obscenity. Lawyers would certainly understand it. Now, the question that presents us, as Bill so carefully brought about, is where do we fit in this new world that electronic discovery has created for us? The vast, immense of, amount of data, its processing, how it is to be searched, create problems that our system have never seen. And the question becomes, which of these models is going to be the model? that we are going to use. Is electronic discovery to be informed solely by the principle that whatever advances a client's interest is to be done and whatever retards that interest is to be avoided? How does that fit in what we are doing? Well, we see obvious tensions. The first and most obvious tension is the tension between that principle and what was attempted to be accomplished by the 207 rules amendments. It is quite clear when you read the, the administrative comments, the so-called legislative history of the rules, that the courts and the draftsmen thought that one of the linchpins of the new system would be the meet and confer responsibility. The lawyers would get into a room and those lawyers would try to trash out among themselves how they would conduct discovery, what would be searched, how would it would be produced, uh, how would questions of privilege be addressed, how about questions of the format of that production. The theory behind the rule is that the lawyers were best advised and 
have the greatest amount of knowledge about their client systems, and if left to their own, would come up with a system that worked. But look at that tension there between that obligation and the adversary system. The adversary system teaches that zealous advocacy and preserving the confidences of a client are paramount in a lawyer's craft. How does that mesh, or does it, with the obligation of the lawyer at the 26F conference to be honest and frank with his opponent? My dear friend Jason Barron and I tested this conflict in a seminar we did at Mercer School of Law. We conjured up a meet and confer conference in which one party has proposed that there be a search for words in a particular set of documents. Words, these words are the words used to denominate a chemical. What the lawyer listening knows that the lawyer is speaking does not is the lawyer has misspelt the word and the search will never turn up the documents needed. And the question becomes, is the lawyer who hears it obliged to correct it? There is no easy answer. Indeed, if that is a settlement negotiation, there really are no pertinent ethical principles that guide. While the lawyers must avoid false statements, there is nothing in the present ethical rules that speaks of an obligation to correct an obvious mistake. How is that to be resolved? I submit it is that those kinds of questions are, are central to where we are. On one side, we have seen, most remarkably, the creation of a new age of cooperation. Um, as you heard, I was honored to be a part of the Sedona Conference, and, I, and particularly honored because I worked and introduced the Proclamation on Cooperation. The proclamation that had as its central principle that there is no inconsistency between transparency and cooperation and a lawyer's obligation to be zealous. The Sedona Conference has given birth to several babies uh, in the Seventh Circuit, in, the, in Maryland, in the Southern District of New York. Rules, new rules have been uh, enforced by those courts, created and then enforced, which require that process of meeting confer to meet certain demanding standards in terms of what the lawyers must consult. Now, the question is that is presented is where do we go from here? Can this adversarial model survive this new realm of the speed discovery? About, I think it was 1973 and 1978, a professor of law named, then named Brazil, he would then become magistrate judge Brazil, wrote an article. He despaired that the adversary system of discovery would ever work. He pointed out that lawyers had no motivation to cooperate since they made money by prolonging litigation. I'm afraid much of what he said has come true. In all too many of the cases, we see litigation for the sake of litigation. It is bad enough when it is motivated by obstructionism. It's particularly horrible when it is motivated by ignorance. When lawyers persist in an objection to doing some, something, when, had they only known better than they do, they would realize that it actually is the cheaper and more efficient way of resolving the problem. Can you imagine, as we learn more about search methodology, how lawyers will have meaningful discovery conferences about search methodology when they don't know anything about what they're talking about. I've grappled with those issues in the cases Bill mentioned, Equity Analytics and O'Keefe. They were painful cries that the bar understand much better than they did what was truly at stake and understood the technology. Now, where this leaves us, I suppose, is to conclude by asking you some very tough questions. I'm afraid I'm going to be your Socrates. And I'm going to ask you some questions which you would rather avoid. 
I hope you won't take me out and kill me like Socrates, but I'll try anyway. What moral principles will you bring to this task? Have you thought about them? What are the central principles by which you wish to lead your life? How will they interface with how you will do your job? More particularly, what's going to happen that day and it will come? When a client or a lawyer says to you, well, we have some emails. They are certainly very harmful to our position. But I've noticed that the other side is not aware of them. I want you to destroy them right now before anybody sees them. And I want to make sure that you use the technical capacity that you learned by going to Bryan University to make sure that no one can follow your tracks. What will your answer be? What will your answer be when you are asked to assist lawyers at a meet and confer conference? And they don't correct an obvious mistake by the other side. Or, instead of figuring out a way something can be done cheaply and efficiently, suggest to you that you tell them uh, what ways are available to make the search as complicated and as expensive as it can be. These answers, there are no easy answers to you, except the answers that Socrates gave a couple thousand years ago. The unexamined life is not worth living. We really know nothing, and that we are, as human beings, in a constant process of formation. So, at the risk of troubling you, I'd ask you, in all your celebration today, to give some of those things some thought. I congratulate you profoundly and deeply on your achievement. I suspect that the manner in which you have been educated will probably become the model as the years go by. Certainly, it is, as Bill said, a very courageous thing that you have done. I am certain it will bring you success, and I hope it brings you much joy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Pacciolo. Uh, and I apologize for getting your middle initial wrong in my introduction. Obviously, John M. Facciola. So we're all improving one step at a time. Uh, your words are appreciated, and thank you for joining our class on this uh, first um, graduation. Uh, at this point, I'd like to mention again uh, that uh, Chris Ewell of our faculty is here along with Darren Niven. Uh, and from the board, uh, George Socha uh, is representing the board at our graduation tonight. Uh, thank you, faculty, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, board member, uh, for attending. Uh,